afternoon, everybody. For those of you I haven't met yet, my name is Patty Movahill. I'm the Executive Director of the League of Oregon Cities. I want to start by thanking everybody for joining us for this legislative wrap-up. Today, we're hoping to give you kind of a 5,000-foot view of what happened during the 2023 long legislative session. I know most of you have probably been to several of our legislative updates, but just to kind of start off a few quick reminders. If you've not already done so, please make sure that your microphone is muted. This will help us keep background noise to a minimum. We also ask if you're able to change kind of your signature line or your status so we know who you are and what organization you're representing. And I encourage everyone to remember that this legislative wrap up is a public space, um, which means it's open to everyone, it's accessible to everyone, and we are recording it. So for those people who could not attend today, they can watch it later as a download. Uh, we will do our best to keep <laughs> tight today and be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, we know that you're all busy, so we will try and keep things tight. So just kind of a little differently, historically, when we've been doing these this session, we've been kind of focusing on bills that might be passed, hearings, action alerts, assistance that we needed. Today, we're going to summarize what actually happened and focus on some bills that we think are going to be of the utmost importance to you. To try and streamline efforts, we'll start today with an overall assessment and recap from Legislative Director Jim McCauley, and then we're going to ask each of our lobbyists to identify three bills that they worked on specifically within their portfolios that we believe are of top concern for cities. So this is going to be a top level overview. That doesn't mean we won't have more information later. So for example, next week, LOC lobbyists will spend the next three months traveling across the state providing in-person legislative updates at LOC small cities meetings. We're going to send two lobbyists to each small cities meeting so you have two issue area experts at each one. Even if you are not a small city, we encourage you to attend these, particularly if you have specific questions. We just ask that you register for those events in advance. Registration is free, but we do provide lunch, so we need a proper head count. And when I finish speaking, I will drop a link in the chat on how you can register for those. The next edition of the Local Focus, which should come out here in a matter of weeks, will have a deeper dive into some of the most important bills cities need to be paying attention to over the next few months, um, particularly some key important effective dates on some legislation. And then later on in the next coming weeks, we will have a more in-depth bill summary. When that bill summary is ready for publication, we will announce it through the Friday electronic weekly, weekly bulletin that you should be getting in each of your email addresses. So today, just kind of a high level, what you can expect to hear from us today is information on broadband, cybersecurity, revenue sources, housing, general governments, economic development, and transportation. Like I said, each lobbyist is going to take three bills that are particularly important to their issue areas and give you a high level overview of what you need to know. But we're going to start off today with Jim McCauley. I think everybody knows Jim. Jim's our legislative director. He's going to try to give a high level overview of what he thinks about the session and what it meant for our members. So Jim, I'm gonna kick it over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Patty. And great to join everybody again, kind of our after session um, download on how things went. So when we go back to January 17th, when the session kicked off, um, we knew that we were gonna be facing any number of challenges. There were both physical um, uh, impediments to the Capitol because of the construction, uh, which all of us I think got through very well. City day was, um, an, an amazing um, day of advocacy for our members. We had an awful lot of um, cities who had the chance to participate. And I think that really helped set the stage for a lot of the work that we ended up uh, really focusing in on for the session. We know it was gonna look different. Uh, we had an entirely new leadership group from both chambers, uh, from both caucuses, as well as a new governor. Now, none of this leadership group was unknown. Um, they were all, part of, um, I'll just say, the former legislative body, um, but it's a different role for them when they take on these leadership uh, positions as opposed to just being a member of the caucus. And I think that was really largely the unknown. We also lost uh, a lot of, um, I'll say, historical knowledge um, with um, individuals. We had a third new legislative body than what we had in 21. And I think what's really important out of that number is that two thirds of the legislative body, when we started up in 23 session, had never worked together. Um, so they didn't have the personal relationships. They didn't have the context on how uh, work was to progress. And I think those pieces became a, a layered impact 
of what became really a frustrating session for not just the League of Oregon Cities, but an awful lot of you, as well as other folks, um, as we were working our way through that session. Um, I think in general, the House had a better flow to process in terms of how they work together. Keep in mind, there was a joint press conference at the front end of the session with um, House Republican and Democratic leaders laying out where their, um, uh, essentially where their priorities were at. And they were sharing a lot of those priorities that were together, they were shared priorities. The Senate effectively was at odds with each other from the beginning. And it really played out later in the session um, and I think was instrumental in triggering a, a 42 day uh, walkout uh, from the Republicans to deny the Democratic leadership a quorum on the floor. So the layering of this in the legislative environment made it difficult to lobby, um, but your lobby team uh, from LOC worked up until the end, advocating for our key priorities that we entered with. Um, we tried our best to improve bad legislative um, uh, bills, and we had some success stopping legislation even on the last day. So I wanna thank every city um, for your collective work. It was helpful, it was noticeable, and it was very critical for any number of legislative concepts that we dealt with. And it's gonna be something that we're gonna to need to build on for the future. So the rest of the conversation for this morning is really gonna focus in on really that snapshot, those top um, three bills from each of our portfolios. Um, and with that, I'll stop and um, turn it back to Patty. Thanks, Jim. And just to elevate and echo, I think a lot of the successes we saw this session is not just because of the work of LOC lobbyists, but because of the work of you um, and your colleagues in your cities throughout the state. You, you made an impact, whether you realize it or not. Um, but let's get into some substantive discussions with specifics. We're going to start with Nolan Plesha. Nolan, I see you coming online. Um, so many of you who've joined have probably become very familiar with Nolan. But just to recap, Nolan's, Nolan's portfolio, I'm tr struggling today speaking, is telecommunications, broadband, cable, energy, environment, and cybersecurity. And Nolan, if my notes are correct, you're going to update us on House Bill 3201, which relates to broadband funding, House Bill 2040 related to the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and you and LOC lobbyist Michael Martin will take a stab at tag-teaming House Bill 3409, which relates to the climate package. So unless I miss something, Nolan, I'll give it to you to discuss those three House bills. Yes, and thank you. You are correct. Um, as mentioned, I had three bills I wanted to highlight today. The first one I wanted to highlight is House Bill 2049, which establishes the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. The legislature al allocated house uh, 4.9 million to the higher educated higher education coordinating commission to establish a cybersecurity center of excellence at Portland State University and to be jointly administered with Oregon State University and the University of Oregon. The center will coordinate, fund, provide educational awareness and training for public, private, and nonprofit sectors. The bill establishes a workforce development fund and a grant program fund to support the university's efforts to provide critical cyber support for local governments, in addition to growing the cybersecurity workforce Oregon needs now and into the future. The center will also provide direct assessment, monitoring, incident response, and competitive grants to local government bodies for cybersecurity-related goods and services. The Oregon Cybersecurity Advisory Council is also established within the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. Cities will also receive a direct spot on the council. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to highlight that due to significant lack of funding provided by the legislature, House Bill 2049 was amended in the Joint Ways and Means Committee to remove the full state matching funds that are necessary for the federal, state, and local cybersecurity grant program, uh, and also reduce the overall impact of the center uh, with the reduction in the operating funds and wider financial support to other higher education institutions and community colleges throughout the state. Uh, the LOC will be uh, advocating for this funding in a September e-board request and beyond. Uh, this is also a redraft of House Bill 4155 from the 2022 legislative session. The second bill I wanted to highlight is House Bill 3201, uh, which aligns Oregon statute to maximize federal funding for broadband. You all have heard me talk about this a lot throughout session. Uh, House Bill 3201 seeks to align Oregon statute uh, in the Oregon Broadband Fund with guidance and best practices from the federal programs. 
the final bill align, uh, aligns speed and eligibility requirements with the BEAD and ARPA infrastructure programs to ensure that Oregon can maximize the funding allocations while removing all the requirements for future broadband funding that can be determined through rule uh, or the programs that they apply to. The bill also ensures that any changes in federal programs can trigger the ability for the Oregon Broadband Office in consultation with the Oregon Broadband Advisory Council to update statute for the broadband fund to make sure that it continues to align with the guidance and best practices. Oregon is set to receive about 900 million in total from the federal government from the varying broadband infrastructure and digital, digital equity programs. The goal of this bill is really to ensure that Oregon cities and potential applicants have as much flexibility to spend this funding according to what guidance allows. It removes the barriers that were previous uh, from previous speed definitions and eligibility requirements that could have prevented some cities from applying for these grants and uh, adds to the state's ability to receive the entirety of the funds that have been allocated. Uh, the next steps you all should be aware of is that you should be connecting with nearby communities their county, the county, local ISPs, community groups, and other interested parties to identify the broadband needs in your communities and to partner together to, uh, for potential grant applications prior to these funds becoming available. More will come on that in the coming weeks and months ahead, so please keep an eye out for bulletins and action alerts for any actions that you all need to take. The last piece I wanted to highlight, and then Michael will uh, take over the final portion of this, is House Bill 3409, which is the climate package. Uh, the climate package includes multiple bills from the legislative session. Some of these sections impact cities while others have little to no impact on cities. There are five sections that impact cities directly and those are the ones that we'll speak to today. Uh, the bill had bipartisan support in the Senate but was voted along party lines in the House. The First piece that has a uh, major impact to cities that I want to highlight is the performance standards for covered commercial buildings, which was originally uh, Senate Bill 870. This creates commercial building performance standards for existing buildings. There are two tiers with separate timelines. Tier one, which includes local government buildings and commercial buildings that are 35,000 square feet or larger. If existing buildings do not meet the building performance standards, owners, or in this case, local governments, will be required to provide upgrades to those buildings to meet the standards set forth in rulemaking that will be decided by the Oregon Department of Energy. It's modeled off of a similar policy uh, in Washington state uh, and is in line with the American National Standards Institute, Institute Standards for Energy Efficiency in Existing Buildings. The bill requires ODO to create incentives that can be used to offset some of the cost of compliance that can be paired with federal incentives. Cities will retain the ability to create stronger standards for buildings six years or older. ODO is, pro is to provide a support program to eligible building owners, including cities, uh, to provide information, periodic training, technical assistance, and other efforts to assist eligible building owners to comply with the energy performance standards. Uh, ODO will adopt uh, and establish building performance standards and must establish and consult an advisory committee that must also include somebody from local governments. Building owners, including local governments, must receive notice by July 1st, 2025, of any buildings that must meet compliance and be notified of, of those uh, requirements. Starting in 2028, eligible tier one building owners must comply with the building performance standards that have been laid out with compliance timing based on the building square footage. Owners of eligible tier one buildings are to report to the, the Department of Energy concerning compliance with the energy performance standards every five years after. And we'll continue to update you as the uh, rulemaking and these timelines come about. So again, please keep an eye out in the bulletin and any action alerts we send out regarding this. The next piece that I wanted to highlight is the Urban Tree Canopies Bill. Uh, this bill uh, asked the State Forestry Department to build and maintain an urban tree canopy assessment tool. The things cities need to be aware of here is that the department will also develop and implement a program to provide technical and financial assistance to public bodies. This includes local governments. 
uh, assistance may be used for planning for, responding to, and recovering from damages to habitats and urban tree canopies due to pests, disease, or other natural or human-created conditions that lead to a loss of tree canopy. This includes the loss of canopy due to wildfires, drought, or pests like the emerald ash borer in infestation. Uh, the effective date is immediate upon the governor's signature, and about 516000 was appropriated to the general fund for two positions at the department and uh, for the associated cost of the program. The third piece I wanted to highlight is the res residential heat pump program. Uh, this is a, an existing program that is being modified uh, for air conditioners and air filter deployment to provide clarity for the program. It clarifies that eligible uh, eligibility and how to determine when entities are eligible. It incorporates changes, including updating the definition of an extreme heat event and the use of forecast zones rather than the county where the premise is located. Money is appropriated to ODO for the program and for the agency to work with OHCS on eligible entities. Eligible entities that can apply must serve or represent uh, communities within an impacted region and may partner with other eligible entities for the grant. This does include local governments, which is why I want to make sure you all are aware of that today. The last piece that I want to highlight here is the uh, Resilience Hubs and Networks uh, Bill. This requires the Department of Human Services to provide grants, support, and technical assistance for resilience hubs and networks. Grants are to be awarded for planning and organizing expenses, expanding development and operations of resilient hubs and networks to provide protection from extreme weather or other potential disasters, and for community resources and services to respond to disasters. Uh, DHS is to consult with the Oregon Health Authority and the Department of Energy to implement for on implementation of this measure, they were appropriated $10 million, and cities are an eligible entity for these grants, but they do not necessarily have to be. Uh, this becomes operative on January 1st, 2024. Uh, and with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Michael to talk about the final piece of House Bill 3409. Great. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much, Nolan. Yeah, I want to keep that, uh, you know, that 5,000 foot view and and at least touch on a common theme uh, throughout legislative session is different policy packages. And so I'll talk about the drought package uh, after this. So the, the bill in question that Nolan referenced creates a community green infrastructure grant program, and it provides $6.5 million in grant funding which will be administered by the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Uh, I won't go through the entire list of types of projects, but there's stormwater management, water quality improvements, water conservation, and a number of things. And the Department of Land Conservation and Development will create an advisory committee on this, and we'll have at least one representative from city. So transitioning into three bills uh, in my portfolio uh, in a key priority for the league. Um, business Oregon's budget, House Bill 5524, contained the governor's request budget for $90 million for the Special Public Works Fund, uh, which provides uh, low-cost loans to work on utility projects, among other things. And we asked and advocated for $125 million to be recapitalized in this program. And ultimately, the legislature recapitalized at $30 million. I, I think that this is largely on some level, there's been historic federal investment recently. So this is sort of pre-pandemic level funding that we've seen, that we're seeing in the Special Public Works Fund. And House Bill 5030, I just touch on that briefly. That's essentially the essentially the lottery bond authorization for the Special Public Works Fund. And last but not least, uh, in the common theme, this legislative session uh, on policy packages is the bipartisan drought package. Uh, there are a number of things in here, and I want to touch high, uh, just highlight a few key priorities. Uh, there's the ratepayer assistance. 
that was effectively going to be a continuation of the $15 million in federal funding that was provided for ratepayer assistance. And it got pared down to a study that the Legislative Policy and Research Office will, will commence in kind of looking at uh, different funding opportunities to uh, fund a ratepayer assistance program. Second, uh, place-based planning was put in the drought package. This is House Bill 2010, uh, and it effectively provides $4 million to continue the place-based planning work that's happening around the state in four key basins. And that uh, um, that just continues that work uh, that was happening um, prior to and continues funding for it. And lastly, the drought package provides $1 million uh, in, in technical assistance for the Association of um, Oregon Water Utilities, which helps small and very small community water systems. A number of our members, uh, I think almost all of our members are part of that organization. So this will help with technical assistance uh, related to water projects. And that's it. Thanks, Michael. And just before you close your video loop, um, just to remind everybody, Michael's portfolio includes water, wastewater, solid waste, and natural resources. And Nolan has done it, but I'm going to ask Michael and each other lobbyist to remind everybody of what their portfolios are in the chat and put their contact information. Because if we run out of time for questions today, I want everybody on the call to know specifically who to direct their questions to if there's a particular bill that's discussed today or one we didn't discuss, but you have additional questions on, you'll know specifically who to reach out to. So the next update we're gonna get um, is from Ariel Nelson. Um, Ariel is our housing and land use lobbyist. Um, she was quite busy this session, as I think most of you know. Um, Ariel, I can see that you're on, and I think you're coming on. Ariel is joining us remotely from the East Coast today. So Ariel, thanks for making time from us from Boston. I think you've got three bills today for us, if I'm correct, House Bill 2001, which deals with the housing needs analysis and an emergency housing package. House Bill 3395, which is the omnibus housing package, and then you're give us, going to give us an update on the governor's proposed housing production bill, which was contained within House Bill 3414. So give us a summation, Ariel. How do we end up this session with everything that came at you? Thanks, Patty, and great to see everybody. So no secret that housing was a top priority for both parties this session, as well as uh, Governor Kotek. She signed three executive orders on her first day in office um, before session even started, um, aimed at tackling the state's housing and homelessness crisis. She declared a homelessness state of emergency. She set an ambitious state target to increase uh, housing development and directed all state agencies to prioritize reducing and preventing homelessness in all areas of the state. So uh, in response, the legislature passed what was known as the 60 day housing package because they did something they don't typically do in a session and they passed significant funding and, and um, pretty um, in-depth policy early on in session within the first 60 days. So that's House Bill 2001 and House Bill 5019. So I kind of, we talk about them together because they kind of um, they, they work as a package. Um, so that passed again early in session with broad bipartisan support um, and included $155 million to meet the governor's goals, which were very specific, rehousing 1,650 Oregonians, preventing homelessness for 8,750 households, and expanding shelter capacity by 700 beds by the end of 2023. There were a few other things funded in there as well. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but we will be having bill summaries come out that you can read those details. There's a new fund that they seeded with about $3 million, um, a revolving loan fund to incentivize the development of moderate income housing that may be of interest to cities. Um, it's for um, intended for pre-development uh, infrastructure costs and related pre-development. Um, then the other key piece in that package was that it established and funded uh, what's known as the Oregon Housing Needs Analysis, um, what we often call ONA uh, for the acronym, um, which applies to cities at or above 10,000 population. It's a, it's a continuation. It builds on previous legislation, House Bill 2003 from 2019, um, related to um, regular updates of, of housing uh, needs analyses, um, housing production strategies. Um, but notable for all cities, um, the package includes $3.5 million in grant funding at DLCD for local housing planning updates and general urbanization work. Um, 
sorry, it's a total of 4.7 million, I should say. So that that bill plus the DLC budget that passed um, in the regular course of session is a total of 4.75 for this biennium available to all cities for housing updates and urbanization work. So I believe the deadline for applications, if your city would like to apply for anything related to housing code updates, UGB expansion, um, that's actually, I believe, the end of this month on the 31st. So we have a reminder for that in the LOC bulletin today, uh, but please make sure that that's, if you're interested in accessing any of those funds in the next two years, you want to get an application in and speak with your DLCD regional representative if you have any questions. So after that initial housing push on that 60-day package, um, there were a ton of housing related bills this session. Um, I think the most activity is was in the House Housing Committee. Um, and I'll talk about two bills, um, one that passed and one that, not, that did not pass. So while most of the activity um, was in the House, there was one bill in the Senate, which you may remember updates on, Senate Bill 847, that um, we called the Omnibus Housing Bill because it had like six bills worth of different policies and funding proposals contained in there. Um, and what they ended up doing this session with all of the bills that were in the House and the big one in the Senate and a couple others, they put them all together into, as Michael said, the theme, the session was packages. So the housing package or the end of session housing package, because we had the early one, was House Bill 3395. Um, and there are several things um, that in there that may require cities to make changes to either your um, local housing development policies or processes. Nothing in there requires you to uh, uh, to uh, to update um, your comprehensive plan, but you you may wish to, or you may wish to include this in future updates for clarity, best practices, um, and to implement it um, most efficiently. Uh, so please do read uh, the local focus coming out um, and our updates for specifics, but I'll just briefly touch on um, a couple things to pay attention to in there, which is um, the emergency shelter siting legislation that's been, um, was first introduced in, uh, I think 2020, 2020 2021 has been um, updated or extended every year. Um, it's now extended um, based on not a not a date, but it's now based on our statewide point in time homeless count. So as so so long as we are experiencing a certain percentage rate of uh, of homelessness, both sheltered and unsheltered statewide, this will remain in effect. Um, but we did get some important clarifications um, in that existing legislation, which is that it clarified that cities do not have to hold a public hearing um, to comply with a bill and approve emergency shelter, um, and also just make some additional clarifications. Um, the other thing to pay attention to this, if you are a city with a population at or greater than uh, 2,500 and below um, 25,000, um, there's a new requirement for cities to update their codes to allow the siting of duplexes. Um, so that's the, the middle housing that was required of all cities at 10,000 and above. They're now extending to another group of cities, but they've included uh, funding to do so. Um, and you have several years to do that, as well as the ability to request an extension um, with, uh, with DLCD if you're unable to meet that or if the funding doesn't come through. It is at the department, um, but we want to make sure that um, cities have enough resources and if you're understaffed or for legitimate reasons really you know, need some extra time, that option is available to you. And if you have any questions about that or want help advocating with DLCD for that, please do contact me. Um, want to be helpful on that. So that's what passed. Um, the last bill I'm going to talk about, the third bill, is um, one that I think folks know quite a bit about, House Bill 3414, which is, of course, the governor's um, housing production priority bill, um, which would have required uh, done a number of things, but it would have required cities to provide adjustments for siting and design standards for residential development. It would have established a housing accountability and production office with some uh, some technical assistance resources for cities. But it would have um, it would have been an office that would have taken in uh, complaints or potential allegations of improper implementation of state housing law at the local level, um, but provided tools and resources there as well. Um, and then it also um, included very late in session was added in the UGB expansion or housing supply uh, concept that had been previously introduced in another bill um, that was an alternate uh, UGB expansion track specifically for housing development, but it was optional. It was always optional for cities. So um, the LOC, uh, as you may remember, and in 
large part thanks to the tremendous advocacy from a number of cities, mayors, city planning experts. Um, we you know, were initially um, opposed to the bill, um, but we were able to work with Representative Gamba and other legislators with local government experience and understanding to get some important structural changes to the bill that led us to eventually reach a neutral position. However, um, cities still had individual uh, positions on the bill. But um, at the end of session, when kind of the action took place with this bill, it ended up, um, we were we were officially neutral. The LSC was not engaged at this point, but the bill did um, fail to pass by one vote in the Senate. Um, it was very close. Um, you, if you uh, didn't see, I can send you the links if you need them. There was a bit of media coverage kind of talking about the political dynamics. Ultimately, um, you know, it seems that the the UGB expansion piece was really what um, kind of did it. And at the end, there was um, some really strong uh, in opposition from the uh, conservation network, from environmentalists. So we did see it fail by one vote in the Senate. Um, so this bill is not law, but we fully expect that it will be coming back in a future session. Um, and there's rumors going around that there may be a special session related to housing supply or housing production. I have not heard from the governor's office that there's any plans to do so yet, but we're not ruling anything out. Thanks, Ariel. Let's keep our fingers crossed. We don't have a special session and we can take a breath for a few months. Um, so I'm going to ask Scott Winkles to come on. Uh, many of you are familiar with Scott. We in-house refer to Scott as our general governance lobbyist. What that means is his portfolio includes a hodgepodge of everything, including ethics, public safety, community corrections, courts, HR matters, PERS, collective bargaining, public contracting, public records, public meetings, anything that you handle internally from an administrative standpoint that's not what somebody else handles is probably Scott's responsibility to handle on your behalf. Um, um, so Scott's got three bills he wants to talk to us about today. House Bill 2805, which deals with serial meetings in the Oregon Government Ethics Commission. House Bill 2395, which is yet another package. It's the opioid package. And House Bill 2296, which deals with PERS return to work. So Scott, what can you tell us is happening in the general governance sphere? So uh, it was a fairly busy session for general governance, um, and it was a bit of a challenge to figure out which three bills I wanted to cover today. So I, I picked the ones I got the most questions about. Um, uh, the first bill I'm going to talk about is 2805, and this deals with serial meetings. I will just uh, say there's two reasons to talk about this bill. One, uh, it will impact city operations, although not, it should not impact them greatly, and two, it will have a tremendous impact on the legislative process. Uh, what the bill does is essentially codify what we call the handy decision, and if you're a city councilor or and you are mayor and you've taken Patty's class on serial meetings, uh, you, you already know what you need to do to comply with this bill, which is to, you know, not CC your council in the emails, don't convene uh, in a serial fashion, um, the the catch what they did add to this bill was give the Oregon Government Ethics Commission enforcement authority over uh, these bill over open meetings now and, and the serial meetings. Uh, if, however, if a complaint is registered, the city would have an opportunity to review and cure before a complaint could move forward. And so, if there's if you get a, a complaint and it's just a, it's a disgruntled citizen who just doesn't like what the city did and they're going to use this as their problem solving tool, uh, the city would be able to review it and say, no, we were in compliance. Um, and then uh, that in all likelihood, that complaint would then not go forward uh, if this should not be a big impact on city governance because we've been training to this standard for a really long time. Um, you, who will be who will be impacted on this is the legislature. I think uh, the they did not exempt themselves from this bill, and I think there is a potential that this will significantly change the way they operate and the way they do vote counts ahead of a floor session or before ahead of a committee vote. Uh, time will tell on that one, uh, but look forward to us. Oh, and and the bill will also require uh, officials to get trained at one at one point during their elected term. Uh, so if you will watch a video or attend a training provided by OGC on this topic, that would that would meet that requirement. And it only applies if your budget's over a million dollars. Uh, so smaller, smaller communities would not have to do this requirement, although we do encourage folks to get trained on this important topic. 
Uh, the next bill I'm going to talk about, 2395, this is the opioid package, and I'm going to confine my comments to specifically to the issues that are impacting cities. Uh, you should all be familiar with the opioid settlements. There have been seven so far um, with both the manufacturers, the pharmacies, the distributors uh, of, of, of uh, opioid medications. Um, we all know what happened there. The, the, overprescribed, people became, became developed substance use disorders. Uh, and, and we now have uh, some civil agreements where they're paying into uh, funds to address uh, uh, opioid uh, addiction. The bill changed the a number of things, but the important thing for cities is that it changed the definition of naloxone. Naloxone is the rescue drug that's provided to a person who's overdosed. Um, there's the, the statute did not allow uh, first responders or non-medical professionals to, to, to deliver sort of the next gen naloxone, which is longer acting. Um, and uh, it, uh, so if you're if you're using uh, it's a more effective medication as well, but the statute didn't simply didn't allow that use. So if you're a city over 10,000, you're getting direct opioid settlement money. And you're purchasing naloxone. Um, you do need to be aware of of this change, so that you'll be able, so the cities can actually purchase the 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 improved uh, product. Uh, and if you're a city under ten thousand, you can certainly apply for funds to to uh, for opioid settlement for, uh, for opioid uh, addiction projects within your community. Um, <clears throat> And you'll be able to get those those products uh, and those those services and, and and those medications through a state purchasing pool. Now, uh, we're going to go into great detail on this in uh, the small city in in the bill summary and, and, and during the, our roadshow. Um, and the last bill I'm going to talk about, 2296. This is work after retirement. And so all this bill did is extend the sunset on work after retirement by an additional 10 years. Uh, currently, if an employee re retires from PERS, uh, they are able to work an unlimited number of hours for a PERS-covered employer. Uh, however, that that uh, that ability sunsetted uh, will sunset in 2024. This bill gives us an additional 10 years for this uh, for uh, for employees to be able to do this. Uh, at that point, it will revert back to the. Uh, a limited number of hours an employee could return to work uh, to unless you're in certain positions. Uh, the bill is actually, uh, the requirement has been, is really punched above its weight and benefits to cities. It's helped employees um, uh, financially during their retirement. It's helped cities because they, you do have to pay into a side account, the normal PERS rate for that return to work employee. Uh, it's reduced the UAL. Uh, it's been a great, it's really been a boon for both the employer, the public, well, and the employee. Uh, so that that was a good win this session. So with that, I will turn it over to Jim. Thanks. I'm going to jump in real quick, Jim, just to give people a heads up. So Lindsay Tennis is our economic development tax and finance lobbyist. You saw a lot from her this session. Unfortunately, Lindsay can't be with us today. Um, so Jim's going to handle an update on her portfolio. Um, Scott, since I'm sure you're going to put your information and portfolio information in the chat, if you could also add Lindsay's so that even though she's not here, if people have questions about the bills that Jim's going to present on her behalf or bills that are in her portfolio we can't discuss today, they know how to reach her. I'd appreciate it. Um, Jim, I think in terms of Lindsay's portfolio, you're going to give us an update on House Bill 2009, which is our yet another package related to economic development incentives, and then give some comments on transient lodging taxes as well as marijuana revenue. Right. Thanks very much. Um, so I am covering Lindsay's portfolio. Um, so the three items for her that really stand out, the first one really is the economic and uh, development incentive bill. It's really an omnibus bill lots of elements in it. That's House Bill 2009. So our primary goal heading into this session was to make sure that we could extend the sunsets for the uh, E-Zone program in Oregon. I think every city who's on this call that happens to have an E-Zone knows how incredibly important these are uh, in terms of uh, incenting investment in your community, creating jobs, and also at the end, helping build your communities um, into a stable economy. Um, it's an incredible program that has worked um, well beyond, I think, anybody has imagined. And that's part of what has 
created, I'll say, some challenges this session with trying to um, get these um, extensions taken care of. Um, we ended up actually with those E zones linking it to an overall semiconductor package. It was part of the recommendations that we came into the session with that came out of a semiconductor mm -hmm. task force. They recognized the importance of these local incentives and attached that to one of those key elements that needed to come out of this session. And I think that was uh, particularly helpful for us. So there have been some changes um, within the uh, E-Zone program. Uh, we were able to get the extensions for um, both uh, standard and the rural enterprise zone out to 2032. Uh, the strategic investment program, specifically the gain share component, uh, was an extension through 2030. Uh, so that is good as well. But there's a couple of changes within the enterprise zone that actually, um, I'll say, scale back the overall incentive at the local level. And this was part of a, a negotiation process. It was very difficult. Uh, we had a heck of a time trying to convince the legislature um, that this is the last thing you want to be doing is to basically scale back the incentives that we have shown. I have tremendous rate of returns uh, in terms of the overall value. So effectively what's happened is for the standard enterprise zone, which is a five-year um, agreement, uh, is effectively the first three years are untouched, but in year four and five, um, there's a, uh, essentially a fee structure in there for schools of between 15 and 30 percent um, that is part of that negotiation agreement. For the rural piece, the first five years of the program are intact, but in years six through 15, there is also a, essentially a requirement for a negotiated fee to schools uh, for uh, 15 to 30 percent as well. The overall impact on the incentive value for these programs effectively is between 10 and 20% less um, than what we entered this session with. Um, at the end of the day, um, we still think that this program going forward is gonna provide um, good incentives. Um, and we're hopeful that there's still gonna be enough to help out with some of the overall uh, investments that we're expecting from the federal government with the uh, CHIPS Act um, that had moved through this session. So um, that's all good and again, I can't reiterate this enough, how important the city's involvement were throughout the process testifying, because we probably had six or eight different hearings on this collection of bills throughout the session. The other two pieces of um, Lindsay's portfolio were really transient lodging tax and trying to solve or find a solution on marijuana revenue. Both of those are effectively gonna get pushed into the 24, possibly 25 session. But what I'll speak to first is transient lodging tax. We definitely need to find a different strategy going forward. And I think realistically, we're going to need a locally driven effort that's going to require cities and your community partners with your chamber, with your hoteliers, with your restaurant folks to really find a solution that you want to have at that local level so we can get some flexibility in how to spend that transient lodging tax revenue. Um, we've heard this so many different times that Everybody knows where the coast is. Everybody knows where Seaside is. Everybody knows how to get there. And we don't need to be spending 70% of our revenue to tell people where the coast is. We could be using it for other things. So that's something that we're definitely going to want to work on in the interim. But it's really going to have to be built off of a locally driven process and try to build that coalition and identify some advocates at that legislative level to help us um, advocate for this in the future. The final piece really is on the marijuana revenue. And I think we're getting closer to really a different formula distribution for that revenue that's out there. Um, Lindsay came, I think, really close with this um, during the session. And I think there's just a matter of other politics going on. So we're gonna get ourselves ready to go um, and try to get this into the 24 session if we can find a bill sponsor or have to push it into 25. But bottom line is, is I, everybody recognizes that out of that marijuana revenue statewide, we lose $50 million effectively of biennium because of measure 110 implementation. So um, that was an amount of money that was promised to us. Still haven't seen the check um, and haven't seen really any progress from the state 
making sure that cities are whole out of that process, despite those earlier commitments from all of leadership who was present at the time. I'm gonna shift um, straight into to my piece here, uh, which is really focused in on transportation. That's where I spend the majority of my time, um, as well as wildfire policy. Um, photo radar, House Bill 2095, 2095, has been a three session long, four session long effort to try to get um, all cities with the same authority that the existing 10 cities have for use of speed photo radar, either in a mobile um, uh, trailer, basically, or essentially fixed photo radar. We got the bill through. Um, you're still going to have to adhere to all of the other process steps and requirements in terms of how you can use these in your communities. But bottom line is, you now have the same authority that um, the existing group of, of 10 cities have had for the last couple of um, decades. So that's a good thing. And it was really attached to a larger um, I'll say transportation safety package that we were pushing as well. It included both great streets program and as well as um, safe routes to schools. The final piece for me here that I think is important for a, um, a chunk of our cities actually, and those who are part of small um, MPOs, those are the metropolitan planning organizations, um, House Bill 2101. This is fund exchange. Um, we have been working with ODOT for the last few years to try to find a solution for fund exchange. And uh, we were able to figure out something that was actually pretty simple. So ODOT is gonna carve out uh, $35 million annually from their overall share of the state highway revenue formula. And that's gonna go straight to the cities that are part of the program. Um, it's gonna cut out, I think, a lot of the um, paperwork and process that you would have. And then effectively the state will keep all of the federal money coming in. The bottom line for us is this stabilizes the revenue flow. It keeps the exchange program going. And it really, again, kind of cuts out a fair amount of red tape um, in the process. So all of that is, is good. And I think the final piece really on transportation is we got funding for uh, interstate bridge project. And the critical piece here is the full billion dollar commitment from the state of Oregon is gonna be coming over the next four biennia. And none of it, at least at this point, is coming out of the state highway fund. It's all geo bonds, which is really the solution that we were after here because there were too many other projects out there that uh, we wanna see built and that were part of the original 2017 um, transportation bill back in the 2017 session. So that's my uh, snapshot as well as, as Lindsay's. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. And Scott was kind enough to put Lindsay's contact information, and I think you already put yours in. So that kind of concludes the overall, you know, 5,000, 10,000 foot view um, from each lobbyist perspective as it relates to three bills. If anybody has questions, I haven't seen any pop up in the chat, but you can certainly put them in the chat. Um, you can also raise your Zoom hand. Um, and we will take questions. We try to take questions first from city officials before we move to the general public um, in recognition that we are, in fact, a member services agency. So if you have questions, um, please feel free to ask. I'm going to give everybody a few seconds to think about it in case you have any and do two quick things. First, a reminder, if you want a deeper dive into some of these issues, there's three ways that you can go about getting this. First and foremost, starting next week, we will have legislative updates at every single small cities meeting. We will be in 12 regions of the state, and you will have the ability to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with LOC lobbyists about the bills they present on and bills that you are specifically interested in that didn't make it in the presentation. There's a link in the chat to how you can register for those small cities meetings. They're free. They're not limited to small cities, but you do need to register so we can get a head count for lunch. In the next edition of the Local Focus, which should come out in the next few weeks, there will be a deeper dive into some of the bills we covered today and others that matter specifically to cities. And the comprehensive bill summary is still being worked on, and that should be out shortly as well. We'll announce that release through the Friday Bulletin. The other thing I want to highlight, particularly because it just happened this week, is we have officially opened registration for the LOC's annual conference. The conference this year is going to happen October 12th through the 14th in Eugene. This is a conference that oftentimes sells out, particularly the hotel rooms. So if you have not registered and you're thinking of going, I would register sooner rather than later, particularly if you're somebody who likes to be in the conference hotel. I'm still not seeing any questions, so I'm going to do one more plug before I ask lobbyists a couple questions of my own. 
Um, the last is that we will be hosting six in-person municipal fundamentals trainings. These are half-day trainings. They cost $30, although that cost also includes a lunch that the league will be providing. And these trainings are going to cover home rule, social media, public contracting, and how you can handle difficult meetings. We will begin hosting these in August. They'll be held in Vail, Echo, Coquille, Forest Grove, Salem, and Redmond. You can find them on the training page of the LOC website. If you or any of your colleagues or staff are interested in attending, it is not limited to city officials. So if you have county officials or special district officials that you work with regularly and think they could benefit from this training, please feel free to include them. I do have a question from Mayor John McArdle of Independence in the chat. Mayor McArdle's question is, what topics will begin being prepped for the coming short session? And what do we need to begin talking about with our specific legislators? So Jim, I'm gonna start with you to give this one a topic. Maybe what I'll do is Jim, if you can give an overview, and then I'm gonna ask each lobbyist to guess one top thing in their portfolio they think is gonna happen in the short session. So Jim, an overview, and then we'll ask each lobbyist for one thing, top one. One thing. Um, I'll start at the top end and make it pretty simple. Basically, everything that we didn't get um, this session will continue to be advanced into the 24 session. And it's ultimately going to come down to whether or not we can identify a bill sponsor, a legislator who's willing to take a uh, bill to advance into the session. Um, I think the other part of this is trying to figure out um, again, I'll just use transient lodging tax as an example. If we can identify um, some push at the local level and identify some coalition work that will hopefully take place between now and then. That's going to give us a better chance at trying to move something through a short session. The key piece here on short sessions is uh, the margin um, is for, for, for error or for a stumble is non-existent. So if you have a bill that moves into the short session and you can't get it out of a hearing, um, it's effectively going to be dead unless there is a leadership intervention where the bill is critical enough that they're willing to advance it um, and do something extra for it. So we're going to have to have whatever we need pretty well greased to have some success for that 24 session. If I look at a longer term piece like transportation, um, we're going to be talking about that over the next two years, trying to advance a package coming into the 25. So some of these things We'll be ready for 24. Some of these things are going to take um, a little bit more time. Jim, if you had one thing you thought in transportation or economic development, anything rise to the top? Oh yeah, it'll be a it'll be a transportation package for us in 25. Excellent. Um, I'm just going to go through who I see the lobbyists on my list. Um, Scott, you're next in my Hollywood squares. One one thing you think is going to rise to the top? Uh, if if you think that there is going to be a 2024 session, I think one of the things that, uh, uh, and I'm skeptical, I think the, I think 110 reform, I, I think you're going to see uh, uh, some, some movement on that. Um, we've already seen, we've already seen the, the signs for that one. Good. Uh, Ariel, you're next in my Hollywood squares. One thing. Uh, no surprise to anyone, housing development, housing production, um, 3414 is going to come back, whether it's before short session or in short session. Um, the Governor's Housing Advisory Council is meeting and working on um, proposals uh, for the governor to introduce in the in this next session. Um, but the LOC has also been invited to share proposals. So if you aren't already part of the what was the Thursday weekly uh, kind of land use development focused email group, um, we'll be starting to talk and meet to, to put together something from our end. So if you want to be involved in that conversation, uh, please let me know. Thanks. Uh, Nolan, you're next. Thank you. Uh, I think for my portfolio, the big thing will be uh, funding related, uh, specifically to House Bill 2049. Uh, we'll be asking for matching funds uh, for the state and local cybersecurity grant funding. Uh, we hope to do that in the e-board ask. It's not clear if they'll do their four rounds of funding one round has already gone through. There are three more, one including this September. So if we do not get the full amount in September, we hope to at least get uh, enough for that just that second round in September. And we will be coming back for additional funding for that and the Cybersecurity Center Excellence in uh, the short session. Thanks. Michael, your last but not least, your one thing. Yeah, one thing. Uh, I would say increasing the recapitalization for the Special Public Works Fund. 
Excellent. So I'm going to elevate what Jim put in the chat to kind of round out the question that Mayor McArdle asked. What should you all be doing? In the short session, you should be having conversations and developing relationships with your legislator. If you don't know who your legislator is or you don't have a relationship with them yet, you can contact LOC staff. Any of those lobbyists there can give you some tips and tools on what to do. Um, there are also some long-term elected officials at the local government level. I'm going to throw them under the bus. Mayor McArdle, you were kind enough to ask the question, but you are also somebody I know who has often offered to provide some assistance if you have a newly elected official who wants to learn how to develop those relationships. So make sure you invite them to your cities. Make sure you have coffee with them. Tell them what matters to you. If you want to support some of the LOC priorities, some of the top topics that the lobbyists just said, but you want some more information or one pagers, please call us. We're happy to get you briefed before you have any meetings with legislators. That's part of what your dues membership pays for. I've got a question from the city administrator in Hines, Kirby Latham. Kirby, did I hear correctly, Scott Winkles, you <laughs> said if there is a 24 session, 2024 session. Thank you, Scott, for putting that out into the universe. Would you like to give some clarity to Kirby? Oh, it's not like I'm the first one, but uh, <laughs> uh, Kirby, you did hear me correctly. I think there's a, I, I think the, the issues with the walkout are not resolved. Um, I, I think there's a there's a reasonable chance that we will not be seeing a full February session. <laughs> uh, Jim, I see your hand up. Yeah. I was just gonna. I wanted to build on uh, Patty your your comments and stuff, and, and my note in um, chat. I was early, I was at a um, um, city county meeting earlier this week in St. Helens. Um, it was great to see both city leaders there as well as the county commissioners. And there were uh, two or three mayors in the room that had actually had the opportunity to have a conversation with the governor and her swing around the state. She's been trying to get out to communities that she hasn't been in before. And my comment to those folks was that's awesome, but now is your opportunity to follow up. So if you did get a chance to meet with the governor, there's no reason why you can't follow up with her or her staff and try to reinforce some of the important messages and your narratives and stuff to her during the interim, because again, our grassroots effort isn't confined just a session. We need to think about this 365 days a year. And I'm just going to elevate some other things to kind of build on that. Um, at the LOC Board of Directors request, LOC staff will have before the end of this year what I'm going to call kind of a package of how you can build those relationships with legislators and how you can successfully lobby for your city's own interest and in direct funding packages. Um, now that we've taken a breath from the end of session, LOC lobbyists will be working on develop that. It will include um, examples of documents, packages that you can review, as well as training videos to use. If you are a mayor who is still on this call and you have not yet registered for, please think about registering to attend the Oregon Mayors Association. That is scheduled between October 10th and 12th in Hood River. Um, there will be specific training sessions on how you can success successfully build relationships with your legislators and lobby on your city's behalf at that. And again, one more plug for the LOC annual conference. Uh, the annual conference this year is in Eugene and it is October 12th through the 14th. You can regi register for that. That now we will also have sessions there on how you can lobby for your behalf and we're actually going to close out that particular session this may be of particular interest to you um, our closing keynote at the annual conference this year will be from a congresswoman a united states congresswoman uh, as well as a state senator and a state representative all three of whom used to be mayors here in oregon and they're going to give you tips on what they wish they would have known when they were a mayor about working with and lobbying state and federal leaders so those are some opportunities you have coming up. I'm gonna close by echoing what Jim started with. Thank you. Not just for showing up for the webinars, but for showing up for your cities, showing up to support your cities and lobbying on their behalf and behalf of the LOC. It's not always easy to see, to see successes in a session like we had, but we had a lot of successes. We made a lot of progress and we definitely proved um, that we have a seat at the table and people are listening to us. So thank you. I will let everybody go. It's Friday, enjoy your weekends. For those of you not living on the coast, try and stay cool. Thanks guys.